The Gettysburg Museum of History, located right here in the center of Gettysburg, PA. Owner and curator Eric Dorr grew up here and has spent his life collecting and preserving history through artifacts ranging from the Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg, World War II, presidential items, pop culture, and more. His museum is free and open to visitors Wednesday through Sunday, 11 to 5 p.m., where you can stop by and immerse yourself in some of the most amazing artifacts that you would never believe exist in the middle of Gettysburg. If you're a hey, fan if of you're Band in of need Brothers of a sign, and, and are in the Chambersburg area, you need not look any further than Bear Sign Service. They offer lighted and non-lighted signs, vehicle lettering and wraps, flags and flagpoles, and can ship anywhere. With over 75 years of being in business, Bear Sign Service is the oldest full-service sign company in Franklin County. So check them out at bearsign.com. That's B-A-E-R-S-I-G-N.com and tell them you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg. It's not, it's, it's a guy who, just give me that one more time. Hi, this is Jake Busey, and you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Nice, thank you. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, episode of Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide. And today, we are talking about the cyclorama. And for those of you who may not know what a cyclorama is, stick around because you're going to learn. Uh, our guest today is a licensed battlefield guide and author, co-author of the book, uh, The Gettysburg Cyclorama. And his name is Chris Brenneman. And uh, you, if you go to the um, uh, Gettysburg Visitor Center today, you could uh, participate in an evening with the painting with uh, Chris. How often do you do that? We do it once a month. Some of the busier months, we do it twice in, in a okay, month. Okay, once a month or twice a month. Uh, Chris Brenneman is our guest. Hello, Chris. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. It's like deja vu all over again. <laughs> right <on. laughs> uh, <clears throat> For those of you who don't understand that, uh, we, we had to redo the beginning because I forgot to hit record earlier. Okay, so um, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Chris Brenneman, and I grew up in York, Pennsylvania, about an hour from here to the east. And I've been coming to Gettysburg since I was a little kid. And I used to climb on the rocks and climb on the cannons. And I just thought it was a really neat place to be. And I knew the blue guys were on this side and the gray guys <laughs> were on that side. But I didn't know all the details. But I've always been a big history buff. And as I got older, the more and more I read about history, I just kept reading about Gettysburg. And, you know, I'm reading about Devil's Den and I could see the terrain because I knew it so well. Yeah. And it, it really helped as I was reading about Gettysburg that I knew the the land as well as I did. It helps it to just be kept, able to picture it. And it just kept bringing me back. There's so many great stories here. Yeah. It just kept bringing me back. Uh, for many years after college, I ran my family's bowling lanes. And I liked doing that, but I didn't love doing that. I didn't know about the guide force until... Um, about 15, 20 years ago. And when I found out about it, I said, that would be something I would love to do. So I quit my old job and started studying to become a guide. And while I was studying, the new visitor center opened. And uh, so I got a job there. I figured the more I'm around history, it's going to be help me pass my guide exam. I liked doing it so much that when I finally did become a guide, I also continued to work at the foundation. And the biggest thing that I love about it at the foundation is working with the cyclorama. So some people may not understand the, what the, the foundation is, you know, um, because they go to the visitor center, they assume it's federal property and it's the federal government that runs it. But that's not the case here. What, tell us a little bit about the foundation. Well, the foundation is a partner of the National Park Service. So um, they work together. And the problem was that the, the Park Service didn't have the budget to right. build a new visitor center and restore the cyclorama. It was in really bad shape in the old building. It took a five-year project to totally restore the cyclorama. They built a whole new visitor center and moved everything into the new visitor center. So I work for the nonprofit group that's a partner with the park that runs the building in conjunction with the park. So the rangers are still at the building. They still do all their ranger programs and walks and talks through there. The rangers still own all the artifacts and everything. And after 20 years, then the foundation will give everything to the park service. Mm -hmm. So that'll be somewhere around 2028, unless they sign some other agreement to allow the foundation to keep running the building, which they probably will, because it's a lot easier to have a, a nonprofit group run a building than to have the government run it. 
Right. Because then everyone would have to be a government employee and it would cost a lot more. Right, right. Um, and, and this is a huge building that we have here. I mean, just the, 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 the electric bill on that thing alone must be a fortune. Oh, gosh. I don't know how much it is, but you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's gotta I mean, be. it's got to be, right? <laughs> huge. Just looking at the size, the heat that place has got to be. Yeah, and then when it's really hot to air condition it, I bet oh, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay. So let's move on now to the cyclorama itself. Um, I'm sure a lot of, uh, well, I was going to say a lot of Americans, but really probably anybody around the world listening to this right now might not know what a cyclorama is. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with the basics. What is a cyclorama painting? Well, it's a giant round painting. Uh, the Gettysburg cyclorama is 42 feet tall, 377 feet in circumference. You figure it's as tall as a four-story building, and it's longer than a football field. It's mm. stretched out. Mm. Uh, but it's more than just a big painting. The, because of the way it's displayed and the format that it's in, it almost has a 3D illusion to it. That it makes you feel almost like you're it's real and you're outside in the middle of the battle. Uh, you're on a raised viewing platform about 15 foot high in the middle of the um, painting. And then there's real objects that lead down from the viewing platform to the edge of the painting to the point where it's hard to tell where the real stuff ended and the painted stuff starts. Yeah. It's almost like it's 3D. Yeah. And it was really beat up at the old building. Some of those elements had been lost. It wasn't nearly as amazing as it is today until they totally restored it and put everything back to the way the artist initially meant it to be. So in the old days, and it's in its original day, would I have gone to see the cyclorama and it would have had this diorama, basically the set in front of it with all of the, uh, you know, with the cannons and the bushes and all that stuff? Or is that something that we added when we restored it? No, that was always supposed to have been there. Okay. And it was there back in the 1880s, 1890s, but at some point it had gotten lost over the years. Okay. Also, 14 feet of sky had been cut off the top of the painting. Right. Um, when What the cycloramas were, really, they were the movie theaters before movies. Uh, you know, for a quarter, you could be transported to a faraway battlefield or a foreign land. And it was so realistic. It made you feel like you were really there. Yeah. Um, so they were the first form of mass entertainment. And it, it goes in with the whole um, evolution of society in the 1880s, 1890s. People started to have disposable income. And they could afford a little bit of money for entertainment. And cyclorama started then, roller rinks, amusement parks, professional baseball. It's all because people had disposable income for the hmm. first time. Unfortunately, when real motion pictures got invented, everybody wanted to see stuff that moved, and most of the cycloramas got neglected, and they're not around anymore. Uh, I like to tell people they're like the A-track tape of their day. You know, <laughs> right. There used to be a whole bunch, not so many left anymore. You know what it reminds me of is um, um, when you know uh, you used to have to get a well, you still do really, but when people used to get a wedding photographer um, for their wedding, and then the cell phone comes along and takes really good pictures and you can put filters on it and you can think that you could take just as good a picture as a photographer can. And then it kind of just, that, that, that hurt wedding photographer. Okay, so it's not the same. Forget it. I'm just, I'm thinking it through. What, in my head it made sense, but <laughs> once I said it, it, it made no sense at all. So go ahead. I'm sorry. You, the A-track was better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just the evolution of entertainment, but really it's got some of the same things that we have today. Yeah. Uh, it's like the IMAX. It's so big. It makes you feel like you're in it. Yeah. It's like a 3D movie because the real stuff that jumps out at you is like the stuff that jumps out at you in a 3D movie. It's just a old days version of the same illusion. But there's more to it than just putting um, a set in front of it that makes you think you're going into the painting. The painting is hung a certain way. That's true. Uh, it's a How huge, does that work? It's a huge round painting, and it hangs from a ring at the top, and hangs down, and there's another ring around the bottom, and there's metal weights hanging from that bottom uh, ring. The weight pulling down on it makes it tighten in the middle just a little bit. So it's kind of... So the center is like a foot and a half closer to you than the top and the bottom. There you go. So it's almost like you're in a very slight hourglass shape. Now, would they have painted it that way, or would they have painted it flat? They painted it like that. Okay. The, the canvas naturally does that because right. of the ring on the top and bottom hold the top and the bottom tight. Right. 
But because it's a woven thing and you're stretching it, it just naturally tightens in the middle. Uh -huh. So if it's hung like that when it's painted, it has to be hung like that. To be seen. To, it's not going to look right if you don't hang it like that in the future. But we didn't hang it that way in the old Cyclorama building, right? Yes. What happened was, after about 1895, 1900, motion pictures started to come out. And everyone wanted to see pictures that move. So they stopped going to see the cycloramas, and they couldn't afford to have them in big, dedicated buildings that were made just for holding these massive paintings. So what they did was they lost the real stuff that leads down to it, and they cut some of the sky off the top Ugh. so it would fit in a big circus tent. Mm. And they traveled around at like state fairs and stuff and showed it in these big tents. Well, the sky is really important, too, because there's a canopy over your head that keeps you from seeing where the sky ends. Mm -hmm. When you cut the sky off and you can see where it ends, it just ruins the whole illusion. Right. So it didn't have the real stuff leading down to it. It didn't have the extra sky. You could see the top and bottom of the painting, and it was just going straight up and down. What I like about it today is you've, we've been able to restore the way it was originally supposed to be seen, right? <clears throat> Including with the diorama. But we've added the 21st century to it. We've got music and, uh, you know, uh, sound effects and, and narration and light. The light is really cool and imaginative. I loved in the beginning... The sun is rising in the east if you look in the eastern sky and you can see the sun rising and then the whole place gets brighter and everything. I just think that's a really cool touch. That's, I mean, that obviously wasn't something that they did back then with the light, right? Correct, yeah. yeah. In the old days, they would have had skylights and gas lights. And they would have just had it in a daylight sort of lighting situation. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until later that they started adding in more and more things. Uh, originally, they would have these guys called delineators. They would stand around and they would be many times actual veterans of the Civil War or the Battle of Gettysburg. And they would stand around in a uniform and tell people stories, hmm. which would have been really cool. But unfortunately, nobody wrote down the stories these guys. Yeah. Tell. Because I bet you there were some really good. Oh, ones. sure. And we've been able to find a couple pretty famous <laughs> guys that uh, were delineators. Like who? Uh, well, there was a guy named Charles Hale. OK. From the uh, Fifth New Hampshire. And he was the assistant to uh, General Cross. And that's how we know about Cross having his premonition that he was going to get killed in the wheat field. Uh, he had given some of his personal belongings to a uh, Hale. Okay. And so he could have told that story in the cyclorama. Yeah. yeah that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. Um, another gentleman that we talk about in our evening program, the evening with the painting we do once or twice a month at the visitor center. Um, there was a gentleman that, his name has just escaped me for one second. I'll think of it in a moment. But uh, he was he was on Stevens Knoll in between Culp's Hill and East Cemetery Hill on day two. A cannonball exploded almost in his face, and he was knocked to the ground. He was hit by 48 pieces of shrapnel. Jeez. They just figured the guy was dead. Two days later, on the 4th, there was a wagon picking up bodies for burial. They picked this guy up, threw him on the wagon, he woke up and says, did we win? Oh, <laughs> here the guy wasn't dead yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he survived. He ended up becoming one of these cyclorama delineators. Um, when they were traveling around in a big circus tent. Did he keep all his limbs? He lost an arm and an eye. Oh. Okay. Uh, he's in the book and his name is just escaping me, but it'll come to my head in just a second. I'll bet you, I'm not I'll bet you Mike Lentz knows that in the comments section. <laughs> um, we'll get it. But yeah, I'll have it in one moment. But uh All I can figure is that the big, the hot pieces of shrapnel that hit him like must have like cauterized his own wounds and he didn't bleed out. Okay. Uh, but yeah, just the fact that this guy survived is amazing. But then he traveled around with the cyclorama. He actually owned the New York copy of it. I forgot to tell you, Philippe Pateau, the French artist that painted it, Paul Philippe Pateau, he did four cycloramas. He did one that was originally shown in Chicago. One was shown in Boston, and that's the one that has survived all these years. And that we have today. So we have the Boston version. Correct. And it was the second one. And then he did a third one for Philadelphia and a fourth one for New York City. And uh, the, the gentleman I was just talking about owned the New York copy for a while and was traveling around in a circus tent showing it to people. He was in Tampa Bay, Florida, and he was showing it to soldiers that were going off to the Mexican-American War. 
excuse me, the Spanish, Spanish American. American. It was in such bad shape, it was literally like falling apart. He cut it into pieces and gave some of the pieces to veterans' posts. Huh. And there's two pieces in the parts collection and one that's uh, privately owned. So there's still three pieces of the New York one that has survived. So you you say, you know, Philip Pateau, the artist, did four. Um, to someone in the audience who's new to all this story, they may be thinking, how much time did this guy have to do? I mean, the dimensions that you give in the beginning make this thing huge. I mean, how did he paint all that? He didn't paint it all by himself. Right. Good question. I kind of <laughs> skipped ahead there. Well, just to, to give you the timeline and everything, uh, an American businessman saw one of Philip Bateau's paintings in Europe. Okay. He was a European artist. Was it a cyclorama or just a regular yeah, painting? Okay. It was a cyclorama of the Siege of Paris. Okay. From the, I think, the Franco Prussian War, probably. Uh, but he sees one of these guys' paintings and he says, This guy is great. I'm going to bring this over to the United States and we're going to get rich. You know, this is a money making, it's like the producer and director of a movie. Sure. You know, and if you want to produce a great movie, you want to get Steven Spielberg or somebody like that to be your director. Yeah. And that's sort of what Philip Bateau was of his day. So he comes over to the United States. He does six months of research. They come to Gettysburg. They take terrain photos. They tour the battlefield with a guide. Um, they built a 15-foot high platform and took pictures in each direction to keep the land really accurate in the painting. He talks to at least three generals plus normal soldiers, does a lot of research, and that's what he uses to paint the painting. But then it takes about a year to paint the painting. Uh, the main artist has a dozen guys helping him. And he lays everything out, but some guys only painted horses. Some guys only painted people. Some guys mm. only painted, you know, Specialized. terrain. So they were all really good at their different yeah, jobs. Yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, he's got a big round studio with a raised platform in the middle. So Philip Bateau can stand back and supervise everybody and make sure everything looks good from where the viewer is going to be seeing it. Yeah, yeah. So it takes about a year to paint. The first one opened in uh, Chicago. It was such a big hit. They tell him to paint three more. And each copy took about a year. So a dozen guys working for a whole year to do each copy. Yeah. That's, but that's still, it doesn't sound like a lot of people considering the scope of this thing and the detail in it. Yeah, you know, but then on the other hand, it's like one guy working for 12 years straight. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of man hours. And yeah. I bet you... I bet you they were doing like 50 hour weeks too. They weren't necessarily right. working short it weeks. It wasn't an eight hour day. Yeah, they yeah. probably wanted to crank this thing out and make money. Right. You know, the faster they can get them out, the more money they can make. Yeah. Uh, is, so, okay. So, so he's got this team of people. It takes them a year to do one, right? What was the first one they did? For Boston, or I'm sorry, uh, Chicago. For Chicago. Now, is it true that uh, if for each city, he would paint a different regiment in a certain spot um, to, that was a, a regiment from that state, at least, if not that city? Well, he didn't necessarily paint them any different, but they had this thing called a key that you would get in your program. That's right. And it was like a round drawing with little numbers on it. And you would say, like, number two is General Meade and number 30 is the such and such Pennsylvania. What they would do is they would change the key in different cities <laughs> okay. and mention more guys from the local area. Right. So they were doing a little local marketing. So, yeah. So in um, in the interest of making a local buck, you're actually not getting accurate history because it could be a regiment that wasn't even near there. Well, you at least got somebody that was near there. Or at least at the battle. Well, I mean, even within like 100 yards. Okay. Yeah, he so wasn't it wouldn't have been. Far off. Wouldn't it have been someone that's like sitting down on the south end of the field or over on Culp's Hill or something? It, right. It was right. somebody that would have been in the vicinity of the center of the Union line. Yeah. But maybe not right at the angle. Maybe moves him 100 yards so you can see him better in his logic. You okay. Know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. <laughs> you so, also have to take into account that in the real world, you know, you're up on this platform viewing the painting. Right. And you're kind of raised in an artificial position, 15 feet up. Right. In real life, there would be someone underneath you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There would be yeah. troops charging underneath the pla the painting. So he has to oh, warp right, those right. troops off to the side a little bit so you can see them. Well, now, so that so you bring up the platform. He um, he he took these pictures. I think you said this before. The, from a platform that's about 15 feet high, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, 
then would then transpose somehow those photographs onto the canvas. Um, I was saying to you beforehand, we were just talking about it. You know, I paint. I would love to be able to paint something this huge. Um, but I don't have the wherewithal to do the math. <laughs> like I, I, I the, the minute somebody would say, you know, I'd be like, yeah, I want to paint a, a 360 degree painting. That's, you know, 300 something feet long and 40 feet high and whatever people are like, great. So what you're going to need is a 15 foot platform. You're going to have to have photographs to shoot in every direction. And then you're going to have to come back and then transpose it over. And you're going to have to, you know, on the, cause they does, there's a small version first. Right. Correct. And then he's got to blow it up. Uh, you know, and this is all without computers, all without uh, electric light, I'm assuming. Right. I mean, in other words, like now I can take a projector, I could take a photograph and I could put it on a, a put a magnifier on it that projects it onto my canvas and I can trace it. And then I just paint it in so I can have a photograph. Perfect painting. Well, They did a little bit of that, actually. So how um, would they have done that? Well, he takes his pictures from that raised platform, uh -huh. and he. By the way, he has some of his staff or a guy with a horse standing at different distances. Yeah, I like that in the painting to keep the scale of the guys right as they get farther and farther That's away. Because you know they had that perspective thing where yeah. you have to figure out how the size gets smaller and smaller. So I'm sure that was very helpful. Then they had a one tenth size mold of the paint, sort of of the painting. So you figure it's four feet high and about uh, 37 feet around, and it's got that inward curve built into it. Huh. And they put a canvas on that, and they do it with charcoal. And it's Phil Bateau and probably maybe one or two of his main landscape guys, huh. the guys whose landscape is their, you know, their specialty. Uh, they do it in charcoal because you can change the charcoal and erase it. Sure. Once they're happy with the charcoal version, they ink it. Then they put tracing paper over top of the whole thing. They trace it and they draw grid lines on the tracing paper. Then they take photographs of the tracing paper. And back in those days, they had the glass plate negative. Oh. They could shine a bright light through yes. that glass plate negative. Of course. And it would project it up there. Okay. And they would draw grids 10 times bigger up on the blank canvas. But when the grids match, you know you make it exactly 10 times bigger. And it was like an overhead projector so, almost. Okay, so they did and have And they that. could sketch it in. Then he takes the small version and he paints over it with oil paint, and that becomes the color wheel to keep the colors consistent while you're doing the big one. Okay. So it is almost like a paint by numbers, yeah, you know, yeah, a, a yeah. more complicated than that. Sure but, sure. but kind of once it's all gridded out and, and sketched in, then the guys that are specialized in horses can start on horses. The guys that are good at trees can start on trees, and everybody can work almost simultaneously. And they have big towers on wheels, and there's like a railroad track running around the base of the painting, so they can move these towers, and guys can be painting at several different places at different heights. Philip Pateau can be standing on the raised platform in the middle, bossing everybody around and making sure it looks the way he wants it to look. Wow. I mean, they so they really sat and figured this out. <laughs> this wasn't yeah. like a whimsical type of thing. You actually figured out the science of doing a 360-degree painting back in those days. So oh, of course yeah. you would. Of course you would. Yeah. So, okay. So they get it uh, done. How long, do you know how long it would have taken to dry? I mean, I guess it would be drying in sections. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Did they make their own paints? That's a good question, too. <laughs> I know uh, the paints that they used back then. Yeah. were many times extreme, very toxic. Yeah, poisonous. And yeah. so when they went to figure out how to match the colors today, it was tricky because some of the colors were made with arsenic and right. cadmium, uh, cadmium and stuff like that was in there. And lead. Yeah. 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 So they had to match, make the new colors match the old colors. And that yeah. was kind of tricky. I know they painted all the sky first because they wanted to get that all on there so it dried kind of like at the same time Okay. to, to keep the sky especially consistent. Got it. I would imagine the whole rest of the painting, there's so much going on, it wouldn't maybe be noticeable. Right. But if the sky dried and one side was a little lighter than the other side, you might be able to tell. Now, we were talking also beforehand about the canvas. Um, I seem to remember, and I feel like it was at, um, at an evening with the painting, um, where I, I got the impression that the canvas 
was actually more like a carpet backing, you know, the stuff that um, you would actually make, uh, you know, weave carpets into. But you said, no, it's regular canvas. It's just a heavier weave. Yeah. Yeah. However, you know, now that I think about it, there is a new backing that has been put on the back of yeah. the canvas to yeah. give it more strength. Right. So that newer stuff that's on the back that reinforcing it maybe is more like what you're Oh, describing. maybe that's what I was confusing. Yeah. So okay. it is technically two layers thick now. Okay. You know, what you're seeing when you're on the inside of it, but then it's got a protective uh, reinforcing background on the back of it. What's fascinating, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever get a chance to go to uh, an evening with a painting, I suggest you do it. I highly recommend this. It is, uh, it, you know, I remember when, so when they built the visitor center, uh, I didn't go and look at the cyclorama. I was like, oh, let's see a painting, right? And this is a gift from a guy who painted. And, uh, and it wasn't until I moved back here in 2018 that I went to see it and I was like, Oh my God. Like what an a-hole I am for, for, for what, a, what an a-hole I am for, uh, for not seeing this earlier. This is amazing. And then I went to a couple of years after that, I went to, uh, an evening with the painting. It was Sue Boardman who did it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I couldn't believe that a, we were allowed to go behind the the pet you know down on the floor under the diorama get crawl under back behind the painting and you can see the curvature of it from down there and i it, it's you really have to do this ladies and gentlemen it is really one of the coolest things that you can do uh, so one of the things i love about it is you know i love when i see a painting i get right up to it and i'm like what are they doing? Like, what are the brush strokes that they're doing to make it look so real? Cause I'm not doing that. Right. And so I want to learn. And of course I never remember by the time I get home, but when you go up to say one of the guys who's laying wounded on the ground and you look at his face, it's like four brush strokes at the most and not very detailed, but from up on the platform, you see an entire face. Mm hmm. Go into that a little bit. You know, it's almost like impressionism. Yeah. Where when you're up close, it looks all blurry and you go back and it becomes something. I don't know what kind of skill, though, those artists had to learn to be able to know that if I paint this here, what it's going to look like back there. Yeah. That is just so cool that they could do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one artist told me they would paint with big, long brushes. Yep. They were like four feet long. The the, would, the handle was. Yeah. Yeah. So that they they were actually back a little ways yeah. as they were painting it. And I think that's another reason why Philip Pateau was up on the platform behind them. So he could verify that that looked really good. Yeah, what you're doing is working. But what it is is, yeah, your brain fills in the missing details. Yeah. And if you see most of what looks like a person, you 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 know you you see a face. It looks kind of blurry, but it's going to look blurry if it's thirty feet away from you. Yeah. So you fill in the rest of the details, and you don't need the, all the details, basically. By the way, the veteran you're talking about was uh, John F. Chase from the Fifth Main Battery. Right, John Chase. Stevens. Yeah, Stevens better. Um, okay, so yeah, so now you have the the uh, little dabble do ya theory there with the with certain things. Not everything is that way. There are certain things that are more detailed because they want it to be more detailed, or it's bigger and be, it's gonna it needs to be more detailed, like a house, for example, or something. Like right. you know, the houses they're not as abstract as these people's faces. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with you there. And things that are really far away that he wouldn't necessarily have to have any detail. Sometimes he does put detail. Uh, for example, I have a picture of general Lee yeah, and his so, staff. All right. So and he is, is a... really far away in the painting. It's just like a little group of guys <laughs> off in the distance. Just hanging out. But if you zoom in with a really powerful binoculars or a really good camera, you can see that Lee is definitely one of those figures. He's on his horse, Traveler. He's looking back at us with binoculars. You can see he's wearing white gloves. So you can see, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to, people don't need to see us here, so I'm going to make this uh, fit the whole screen, yeah, well, as best it can. Uh, so that's the aspect ratio of the picture there. But look, so there it is. There's Lee and his staff. Uh 
And there, I, I would imagine, would you say where the Virginia Monument is, like roughly in that area? It's just a little bit north of where the Virginia Monument is in the painting. And I mean, if you look at it closely, it's not very, I mean, you're saying it, it's detailed, but it's not. It's like, you know what I mean? Like it's, um, it's a detail that no one really noticed unless you really went looking for it. But the detail of the figures is very abstract. It's really just a clump of paint in certain shapes. Right. Right. It's enough that if you were focusing in with binoculars, it would still seem like something. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I see what you're saying. You can definitely tell which one is Lee. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's on the white horse right in the middle there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I think that's pretty cool. So even if you had binoculars, it still looked good. Yeah. That is pretty cool. So, um, well, now that we're into pictures, let's talk about some of the details of uh, the uh, of the cyclorama here. Let me go. Let me get rid of this one here for now. There's Lee. Okay. So, uh, what other ones do we have here? There's uh, well, Lincoln. Everybody loves Lincoln, right? And Lincoln is supposedly in the in the painting. Now, I say supposedly because Philip Pateau never said that is Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Well, it was never in any of the official keys Uh that I was telling you about. But he visited Gettysburg in 1914, and they showed it to him. And supposedly he pointed out Lincoln to the people that worked at the building at the time. Got it. And that story has been repeated ever since 1914. So So I think we have pretty good, uh, let's say, verbal history of it that that that's accurate. And, I mean, it really looks like Lincoln. I, I, I think too much to be a coincidence. Well, let's let's uh, let's get to that one there. Where what did I call it? Real Abe. There it is. Okay, so here's Lincoln. Now Lincoln, in this case here, is being um, carried off. Is he supposed to be dead or wounded? The story is that he put him in as a wounded soldier because he symbolizes a wounded nation. Oh, okay. so that's what Philibato said. He why he did it that way. All right, all right, that makes sense. Um, Okay, so then, sorry, I hit the wrong thing. I guess I need better glasses. Uh, what what are the other ones we've got here? Let's see. Oh, okay, now, so Philip Pateau puts himself in. Mm-hmm. By the way, for those of you listening on the audio-only version, these visuals are available for our first lieutenants over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. So Philip Pateau, let me get rid of uh, Lincoln here. Where did he go? Real Abe, there he is. Man, I wish I had a producer with me right now. Okay, there he is. And uh, which one is he? He's the guy with the sword resting across his knee, leaning against the tree there. There he is. Probably the coolest looking figure in the entire painting. (laughs) Right? Like, yeah, just calmly and coolly just resting against the tree. Well, you know, and there's a picture of him pointing himself out. In the painting. So there's a picture of the real him pointing at oh, oh, that's the, right. yeah. the version of himself. And what's kind of interesting is he's a little bit balder and a little bit more overweight <laughs> in real life than he is in the painting. You oh, know what yeah. I'm saying? Oh, I, please. I would, if I were to paint myself into a painting, I'd be all muscular and yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's at least going to be the, the younger, thinner Chris, at yeah, least, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Of course. Who wouldn't? I mean, when you're a painter, uh, you know, Bob Ross always used to say this, you're God. You can make, it's your world. You could do anything you want. That's right. Um, all right. So then that was, oops, that's, uh, that's Philip Pateau there. Uh, okay. Now, uh, what about, oh, 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 oh. Now, there are people in this who are not, uh, let me make sure I get this right. They were not in the battle or they were not at Pickett's Charge. Well, in some cases, both. Okay. Uh, so what about, what's the case of the Bird Brothers? The Bird Brothers were in the battle, but they were wounded on the first day. Okay, so uh, they weren't. They're from Romulus, Michigan. They were in the 24th Michigan of the Iron Brigade. Uh-huh. And you can see in the picture there, one guy got hit in the arm, one guy got hit in the leg, and they helped each other off the field. Okay. But they wouldn't have been in the middle of the high water mark during Pickett's Charge two days later. However, when Philip Bateau was in Gettysburg doing research, they were in town doing a reunion. Ah. And he must have thought they were really nice guys, so he snuck them into the painting. Okay. But if you see, they have gray hair. Yeah. So I'm thinking that's what they looked like when he met them, not necessarily what they looked like during the battle. 
I wonder if that's his way. Yeah, it's his way of saying. And then also, they're they're not facing the battle, right? Right. Now, is, aren't there other figures that are also not facing the battle besides these two? It seems to me like any assistants that got snuck in or people that were creatively inserted, uh, they're not fighting. Right. Uh, they're looking at us, and they're not shown as combatants. And that was part of the tradition. When Philippito snuck himself in there, he was saying that he helped create the painting. But if he had signed it, it'd be like taking credit for the whole thing by himself. So that was sort of their tradition. By sneaking themselves in there, they were saying that they helped do it. But they didn't want to show themselves as fighting because that'd be like saying they were actually in the battle. Uh, there's another assistant standing there with his arm in a sling. And, you know, look at the Bird Brothers. The, the, all the fighting is occurring 15 feet behind them. Right. You can I see mean, they're the backs awfully, of the guys behind them. They're awfully casual for guys that there's bullets flying 10 feet away. Yeah. You know? It looks like one of the guys is like, hey, yeah, well, you know, this uh, George Meade, I'm not really sure about him. Yeah. Like, he's kind of just like leaning in and the other guy's like, can we just get away from the bullets first? Right. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Who, who bandaged their wounds if they're only 10 feet from where the firing line is? You know <laughs> what I mean? That's a great question. <laughs> right? Yeah, I never thought of that one. The, the same thing with the one artist who has his arm in a sling. You know, he definitely looks way too casual. <laughs> right. Now, I think I found a couple other assistants in the hospital scene. One guy is giving water to a friend, but okay. he's looking at us. Looking at us. So... Uh, the, the you mentioned before that when they did the photographs they had a, you know men or men on horseback or you know or just a horse um you know at, at various distances from the camera to get perspective when they went and painted when they transferred it over do you know did they did they transfer over the the models i mean i would think like for example i'm going to go from my photograph to my charcoal drawing right um, well, I, I'm going to need perspective of a person on that plane for the rest of my drawing. So then do I, do I put him in and then base my other figures off of him? Is he my, whatever you call that? Or do I not put him in and then just start from scratch? I mean, I would imagine that they had to, right? I would think a little bit of both. Because, like, one of the guys in the picture is standing almost at the same place Phil Bateau's, uh self-portrait is. Okay. So he probably did intentionally use that guy from then on to keep the scale right. Right. Of guys behind it. Do we have the photographs? Yeah. Yeah. They're all in the book there. So we could theoretically, like, take the photographs and go look at the cyclorama and see if there's a figure where the model is. Right, and there is in a couple places. In a couple places, yeah. okay. So they said so yeah. that we know that he did do that a few times. Yeah. But they're not necessarily in the same pose. No. Right. Now, I think he had models that stood around in different poses and uniform uh, to make some of the scenes. Right, okay. And probably his assistants helped do that too, and that's why they got snuck in. Maybe. Right. Okay, all right. All right, very good. Now, uh, what else? There's the Bird Brothers. There they are. Now, uh, everybody loves, it seems, uh, dogs. We've got dogs on monuments. We've got the story of, uh, was it Sadie? Sally? No, Sa Sally. No, what's the, no, Sally's the one on the monument. What's the one on Culp's Hill? What the hell's the one that... They, oh, the one that runs back and forth yes, between the lines. Yes. You know, I don't remember what the name of that dog was, but I just remember the quote that I don't, the Union please General... Don't, I don't... I, it, I can't... It'll make me cry. It'll make me... <laughs> I can't hear it. That's the story. I can never tell that story to anybody, and I can't hear it. It's the worst. <laughs> You're getting me going. All right, go ahead. For the sake of the audience, go ahead. I'll mute my mic so they don't hear me sobbing. Well, the dog ran back and forth between the Union and Confederate lines during the firing several times. Yeah. Apparently its owner was a confederate who got hit and it stopped and it was licking its owner when it too got killed uh, but Union General Kane ordered them to give the dog a proper burial he said that dog was the only Christian minded soul on this field yeah which you know the only thing trying to not kill somebody right you know and it's just going and licking the hands of of a poor owner. people yeah yeah uh, and now Sally the dog of course is from the 11th Pennsylvania and uh, she supposedly uh, barked at the enemy during battle. Yeah. And she was like their mascot. Well, they were up on Oak Ridge on day one, and they got forced back. They lost the dog in the confusion of the retreat. But they couldn't go back to Oak Ridge to look for it because that was Confederate territory for the rest of the battle. 
When the battle ends and the guys from the 11th Pennsylvania finally got out to Oak Ridge, Sally the dog was still there guarding the guys from their unit. Ugh. So they got, the, they got the dog back and they have a little statue of her on their mind. Uh, yeah. Now, in the painting, there's a small black dog howling over a, a, a dead or badly wounded Union guy. Mm. And it seems to be the same general shape and color and everything as Sally the dog. There was a rumor that that was Philip Bateau's dog, but uh, I've never been able to find anything to corroborate that. Uh, unfortunately, if Philip Bateau had a diary, it no one knows where it is or it has not survived. It would be a gold mine yeah. if I could find it, because then I could say for sure that, you know, this guy that I'm pretty sure is an assistant that's snuck in over here, for example. What's his name, though? Does, what's his backstory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's got to be a whole lot of neat things. When I talked to such and such a general, he told me this story. So there, so I, I painted it in, in this area, yeah. you know. I bet you there'd be a million of those. If if that exists and it ever turns up, I would be, I'd be so happy. Now, let's say for fellow doggy lovers out there in the audience that want to come to the Cyclorama and see where this dog is. I've never seen this before. Where would I go and look? In the area of Meade's headquarters, okay, uh, there's a well and a hospital scene. Uh huh. And Lincoln that we just showed is just above the well, and then just to the left of that, there's these wounded guys and this dog. There's a you big know, haystack nearby. It's funny too. because I've always only focused on the well, and now you bring up the well. The well is a really cool, um, well, element of the the cyclorama because it is half paint. Half practical. Yes, it's really Explain cool. Explain that. Well, you know, the fr it's, a, it's a stone well, and the front half of it is made of real rocks. The back half of it's in the painting, and it's painted. There's a tripod that's holding up a rope that goes down into the well. Two of the legs of the tripod are in the painting. One of them is a real piece of wood that leans up. It looks like it touches the painting, but it, it just misses it by like okay. one inch. <laughs> uh, then there's ropes that go down into the into the well that are real. Yeah. They're painted to a certain point, then a real rope just hangs down. Yeah. And there's just a pin that goes through the painting that that rope hangs from. That's so cool. At the old building, when they didn't have a diorama, they had sewn some sky onto the bottom of it and painted over it with some rocks and bushes to make it, you know, to make it not look quite so weird that yeah. it didn't have a diorama. Right. So they painted in the front half of a well but it had a tripod that only had two legs, and the guy was holding a rope that didn't go anywhere. So there was no rope going down into the actual well. So it looked really weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, but it looks so much better now. And people ask, you know, where's the real stuff end? And that's a great place to show them, because it literally cuts the well in half. Yeah, that I was most impressed with when I first saw that. I thought that was a really neat uh, detail mm -hmm. there. Um, all right, so what else did you get? Okay, now, so, but there are apparently, uh, apparently, excuse me, other sightings of Abraham Lincoln in the photograph. Now, we showed you the photograph before of Abraham Lincoln um, being carried away. Mm -hmm. And it, it's clearly Abraham Lincoln. I mean, it, the, the face is him, and we all, but Philip Pateau also pointed him out. So we yeah. know that's Abe. But then there's other uh, people that's, that claim to see Abraham Lincoln. Now, this one is tough here. Let me see if I can. Uh... Yeah, one of the questions that was submitted asked about another guy near Lincoln that was sort of similar. And uh, I searched around the whole area, and this was the guy that I found that was closest. But I just don't think it's Lincoln. He's just not nearly as close to looking like Lincoln as that other uh, guy did. Yeah, I mean, to me, he just looks like mush. Uh, and we, you know, I was looking at it closer before on the monitor and I, I, I tilted my head upside down and I wonder if I could actually do that here for the audience so we can, we can see. His hair is also kind of reddish. Uh, yeah, right. Reddish hair. Uh, let's see. Flip. Let's, what do I want to do? I want to flip it. Rotate 180. There we go. Yeah. Now, now, now we're looking at him right side up. And he looks like a, actually looks like a friend of mine. It doesn't look like Abraham Lincoln. I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> there, there. Look at that. He, yeah. No, this is a young man. This is not Abraham Lincoln. Sorry, whoever whoever brought that to your attention, 
tell them we've we've debunked it. It's All not right. Abe. Now, we don't want to answer everybody's question before we get to the question and answer no. thing. Uh, I, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about. Um, the the cyclorama that you see, it's kind of like the director's cut of the cyclorama. Oh. And the, something I discovered as I was doing my research for the book was that they actually opened it in Boston, showed it for a few years, closed it down for a little bit, kind of spruced it up, and then reopened it again. Huh. And they were listening to feedback that the audience was giving them on the platform in Boston. They were using that feedback to improve the Philadelphia and the New York copy. Uh -huh. And then when they finished the Philadelphia and New York one, they spruced up the Boston one. Interesting. And uh, I was able to find areas where some more troops were added, more flags were added. Uh, General Meade was initially not in the painting, and they added him later. Poor Meade. And... Uh, well, what's really interesting is after it was in Boston for a while, they sent it to Philadelphia. And I think the biggest reason they sent it to Philadelphia was because Meade wasn't in it, and now he is. Uh-huh. Okay. You know, how cheesed off must Philadelphia have been that their hometown guy commands the Northern Army, and then the painting comes out, and he's not in it? Yeah, right. You know, that right. must have really uh, stuck in their craw. And when they sent the, the updated version, I hope that made them feel a lot better to see Meade very visible again. There are a lot of changes. There is a chapter called Notes on Changes to the Original Painting. And I'm looking at them here. There there are a good deal of paintings, or changes. But, you know, another thing is, and uh, this is often pointed out in the uh, evening with the painting, or at least the ones I've been to, um, the ghost. You know, all you ghost people, you want to... You want to see a ghost? <laughs> it's in the cyclorama. Um, That's a good one. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. Uh, what it is is there's a line of troops in the background. Uh, they're like the provost guard. They're supposed to gather up uh, prisoners or anybody that tries to run away. Well, there was a line of maybe 20-some guys. They penciled in four guys, but they forgot to paint them. <laughs> then they, when they painted over them, the pencil bleeds through the paint just a little bit. Right. And you can see the ghostly outline of where these four guys were supposed to be. And it's an Italian term called pentimenti, when the, the pencil bleeds through the paint a little bit. So you can see pentimenti around these missing ghostly figures in the painting. Also, I think you can leave, uh, you can see Armistead's spirit leave his body, right? Uh, isn't Armistead's... Uh they didn't paint him in exactly where they drew him in. Right. And so it's almost like you can see the outline of his body just behind his actual self. You're right. It almost looks like the recoil of him <laughs> falling backwards. Yeah. And so uh, and, and, uh, did people like did you discover those be from the restoration or do we know about those ahead of time? I discovered it just by comparing old photographs to newer photographs. Okay. And uh, I was really excited. You know, talking about the Battle of Gettysburg, if you pick a subject about the Battle of Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge, let's just say. Yeah. Is there 50 books written about Pickett's Charge? 75 books? I mean, who knows? Right. You know, to actually be able to find something new that no one knew about. Yeah. Like, I was really excited. There's not many topics that there's new things to discover about the Battle of Gettysburg. So the, the fact that they had changed it was really exciting for me. You know, what's interesting is um, I've become in the last year or so a little more interested in the history of tourism uh, here in Gettysburg. And, and this is certainly part of that. I mean, this is the way people... This is the Morgan Freeman movie that we watch now, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's the documentary and entertainment of its right. day. Yeah, except they don't have anybody with the great voice of Morgan Freeman. I mean, let's be honest. That's the best voice ever. <laughs> but uh, I, I digress. Uh, the uh, uh, So it's just fascinating to me there because, you know, again, like, or not again, but we we find that um you know he has to make some changes and therefore really frivolous reasons you know like oh well this is going to be in this city so let's you know we're, you know we're going to change the key we're going to lie in the key just to make everybody feel good um like little things like that but 
how many people saw that in the key and didn't know, which I'm going to assume is all of them, didn't know that they that unit was not that unit that was not there at the time of the battle. We just put that in there because they're from Illinois. Um, but he does it. He does it vague enough so that it's it's reasonable. Okay. You know okay. What I mean? Yeah. 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 I get you. Like the seventy second Pennsylvania in Pennsylvania is the nineteenth Massachusetts and forty second New York. Uh huh. And there, one is charging in like this, and one is charging in right next to him. Okay. So they're pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. In the one he, one of the keys they do mention the first Minnesota in that area. So you move a them a, a couple hundred yards. <laughs> now they're north of the cops of trees instead of south right, of the cops of right, trees. Right. Right. But they did charge into the high water mark at the very end of it. You know, maybe only a few of them, but they were some of the guys that were shifting that direction at the very end. Right. Weren't there only like 35 of them left or 38 of them or something like well, that? Well, they had 100 guys on detached duty that had returned that after returned, day That's two. right. I forgot. But then they lost some of them in the bombardment and stuff. <sighs> so I think they were back to about 140, and then they lose like 30 or 40 more of those guys. I'm telling you, man. So yeah, the f- first Minnesota. Those first Minnesota guys are... I'm just going to move that into your face there. They really... Uh, they're really in some bad places. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's do this now. Again, once a month, sometimes twice a month, evening with the painting. It's after hours, right? Because you guys Correct. have to run the regular shows. So it's after five or four. Well, I was In the winter, we close at four. In the summer, spring, fall, we close at five. So we meet in the education room, and I do a PowerPoint about the history, the restoration, uh, all the different versions of it. Then we take the people underneath the painting, and then we go up on the platform and point out all the people, places, and things in the, in the picture. Uh, you know, in a normal show, you see the sound and light program, which is neat that you talked about. It's really cool. Yeah. But you, you have about five minutes after the sound and light show to soak in the painting. It's just so big, and there's so many details. And, and well, and you don't know what you're looking at. There's nobody saying, if you look over here, there's this. There's, it's just kind of explore on your own. Yeah. This there's not is, enough time. This is not that. And so, like, if you've, if you've been here and you've been to the cyclorama during normal business hours... And you're like, what do I need to do this for? I've been to this cyclorama before. You're wrong. Right. You're wrong. This is not that. This is different. And you are going to fall in love with the cyclorama like I did. I mean, I suddenly became, you know, enamored with this thing because of an evening with the painting. So I really, uh, really suggest you do it. Well, and you know, me too. Uh, I was telling you, I had seen the painting many times as a kid. And I thought it was neat. It has a lot of action in it. Sure. But it didn't blow me away. When Sue started doing her talks about how they were going to restore the painting with the 3D elements, I thought to myself, well, that sounds pretty neat. Yeah. You know, but when I walked in the visitor center and they were, I started working there, they weren't quite done yet, but they were almost done. But the first time I went up there in the upstairs and I saw what it looks like the way it's displayed now. Right. Where it's got the, the 3D feel to it. It just blew me away, and I've been hooked ever since. And Sue was the one that got me into it, uh, and you know, it's just my favorite thing. Now. It's, yeah, so no, it, it's fascinating. Um, here, uh, this is another one. Uh, this is fake Abe, right? This is another fake Abe. Maybe I don't know. That could have been another oh, guy. No, that, no, no. I'm sorry. This is Doctor Stu, uh, Studi. Yeah, he was a local doctor that we think also may have met Philip Bateau and got snuck into the painting. Oh, that's right. Okay, sorry. Was he was an older through. guy, so we think it's that guy there with the gray hair. Yeah. There is a chance Dr. Studi could also be the guy in the, there's a lean-to, and it looks like he's about to start, you know, maybe sawing off a limb. There's another guy that could also be Dr. Studi. But he was an older gentleman, so I think that might be him. The guy right in the center there with his back to us yes. uh, and the white hair. They're working on the kid's leg. Yeah. That's Dr. Studi. All right. Very good. Well, uh, why don't we do this? We'll take a break and we'll hear from our patrons and see what questions they have for you about the Gettysburg Cyclorama. If you are watching and you haven't picked up a copy of this book yet, this is the cover here. Uh, it's nice. It's big. There's pictures. My my favorite type of book. A lot of pictures and uh, <laughs> not a lot of words. Uh, no, there are a lot of words, too, so that you understand what you're looking at with the pictures. But anyway, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back after these words. 
when you're dragging us out of bed The hairs must up on your head You picture the twentieth main And you're happy once again Fight the battle against being slow With little brown top row this special episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you by our first coffee brand, Little Ground Top, roasted to perfection by our friends over at Bantam Roasters. Take the high ground every morning with a piping hot cup of Addressing Gettysburg's Little Ground Top Trademark. that features notes of cacao, wildflowers, and toasted sugar. I even taste a hint of black pepper in mine. I look forward to my cup of Addressing Gettysburg's Little Ground Top Trademark. every morning, and you will too. So grab your multiple bags today at AddressingGettysburg.com slash cafe or drop into Bantam Roasters at 82 Steinware Avenue across from the Dobbin House during your next visit to Gettysburg. And hey, now that Little Round Top is open, imagine enjoying a thermos of Little Ground Top while checking out the view from the hill. Outstanding. That's AddressingGettysburg.com slash cafe or drop into Bantam Roasters at 82 Steinware Avenue during your next visit to Gettysburg. Who can forget the sounds of the 60s? The 1860s. I can't and you can't either. Now, there's Marching Through Georgia, the exciting new album by Billy Webster. All of your favorite hits of the 1860s in one place. Such hits as Gary Owens. The Battle Hymn of the Republic. All quiet along the Potomac tonight. Marching through Georgia. And much, much more. So what are you waiting for? Go to billysongs.com and order your digital download of Billy Webster's Marching Through Georgia today. That's billysongs.com. For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. If you're a lover of history, then go to trhistorical.com. There, you'll find apparel, drinkware, decor, and more featuring a wide range of subjects from the ancient world to the Cold War. Looking to make an impression with the perfect gift? Well, TR Historical now offers a vintage wrapping service for a truly unique presentation. And our listeners will save 15% when using promo code GBERG1863 at checkout. So go to trhistorical.com. TR Historical, for the love of history. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg Podcast right. with Matt Callery. And we're back with Chris Brenneman. We are talking about the Cyclorama, the Cyclorama painting. Very exciting painting here at Gettysburg, and you can come and see it uh, yourself. It is uh, property of the U.S. government or of the uh, foundation? The U.S. government. U.S. government. So you own it, ladies and gentlemen. Come and see it. Uh, let's start with the questions. Of course, if you want to ask questions, you've got to be a patron. Uh, most patrons can submit questions via email, um, and uh, the first lieutenants are the lucky ones, though, because they get to watch these live, and then they can call in if they want to, and we might have a caller or two today. So let's get to the first submitted questions here. Jamie Umstad says, uh, when was Abraham Lincoln added to the painting? As we'll start with that one. She has three. It seems to me like he was always there. Uh, I have old photographs that were taken before he jazzed it up, as I was telling you about. Right. <laughs> uh, and he was already in there before he jazzed it up. 
What's interesting, though, is when I look at some of the other versions, like the New York copy, the guy in that spot doesn't look like Lincoln. So I don't know. Huh. Maybe he snuck Lincoln into other places in other paintings. Maybe he wasn't popular in New York. Did he? Uh, did uh, New York vote for him? Yeah, they did, didn't they? Prob- well, I don't know. New York mm. might have been Democratic at the time. I thought New Jersey was like the only state that went uh, stupid. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I don't know for sure. I don't know. Maybe, but there were a lot of new, there were a lot of Democrats in New York City. At least. Yeah, um, but I would think, I don't know. Maybe he put him in at different places. Maybe he put himself in at different places in different paintings. Yeah, I, I would be uh, you in know, there like fourteen. I wish times. I could you know ask the guy these yeah, questions. It'd be really cool. You know, if I'd have been in the working at the cyclorama the day that he actually visited, I'd have had fifty questions. Yeah, for of it, course, you know. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, Jamie says, was there a signal station on Little Round Top on July 3rd? It seems like it would have been removed after the 2nd. Hmm, I wish Jamie was calling in on this one, because I would like to ask her, por qué? Por qué do you say that, Jamie? But go ahead. Yeah, I, I looked it up in the ORs, and they were definitely still there on the 3rd day, and I don't see why you would move a signal station. It's such a great view. Yeah. There's not a better view to be found within miles, you know. I mean, who wants it? You know, the sunset is beautiful up there. I would imagine on the 4th, they started moving it as the they knew the armies were starting to get into motion. Also, it was probably raining so hard on the 4th that you couldn't see anything from up there. Right. What's the point? Yeah. And then she says, what other signal stations are visible in the cyclorama? Are there other ones? There are. There is a small signal station on Cemetery Hill. Of course. Because you got to be able to send the message to somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, uh, and, uh, and Cemetery Hill from that spot, they could quickly get to Meade's headquarters and give him the information. Now, in real life, there was also one on Powers Hill, but you can't see anything can't, no. in the cyclorama. Now, you you said something interesting about the signal flags before. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that? They're not the right kind of signal flags. Mm. Uh, it's a tall pole with different colored flags on it. That's like what the Navy would have used, uh, where you different colored flags and different patterns signify different messages. The Army would have had a flag that they wagged back and forth, almost like what the lifeguards use. Yeah. And someone with binoculars or, or a telescope would have watched them, translated it, and then flagged a message back to them. Uh, so he has the wrong kind of signal station, but he has it in the right location. So I think when he went to the War Department, they just showed him the wrong kind of flags. But the thing that's interesting is it was so dirty and beat up, you couldn't see either of those signal stations <sighs> very easily at the old building, but they, they look great now. Now you can see them. Uh, Gerald Madden, he says, my understanding is Lincoln is in the painting. Where is Lincoln? Well, we pointed that out before. Uh, and he says, one man has, uh, I'm sorry, one has a man looking like Lincoln being carried by two soldiers. And there is a second man who looks like Lincoln, not far from the first lying on the ground next to a haystack. Maybe it was Lincoln twins that he was trying to do there. Well, yeah, the guy near the haystack was the one near Dr. Studi that we just pulled up. And then the other guy was the one with the sort of reddish hair. Right. So I think, I don't think either one of those guys is Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they have beards. There's some similarities, but not nearly. The one that is him really looks like him. There's, you know, uh, when you look at the one that Philip Ato said looks is Lincoln, right? You can see it's Lincoln. The other guys look like Lincoln, which is, to me, uh, the distinction. Like, you resemble Lincoln because you have a beard, maybe you have a long face, you're skinny, whatever the case. But... This guy is Lincoln. You look at it and you go, that's Lincoln. I don't need to be told that's yeah. Lincoln's face. Well, he also does look like tall and thin. Yeah. I, I think the other guys maybe just look normal. Right. You know, they look so like I think normal he looks, guys. He looks like a tall, thin guy. You know, so, yeah. Um, uh, how many uh, how many paintings are still around and can you see them today? So you, you said there's pieces of other ones. There's a couple pieces of the New York copy have still survived. And where are they um, Two are in the park's collection here, here at Gettysburg. Okay. Do you one ever take is, them out? One is privately owned. Um, they haven't been out in a while. They used to be on display in the old building, in the old cyclorama. Okay. Uh, and there's pictures of them in our book here. How, how, because these aren't Xerox copies. These are, I'm doing it over again copies, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, how, and was it the same dozen guys working on well, uh, he did the first two in Europe. Okay. And he was getting charged such large um, 
like import fees and tariffs and stuff. He set up a studio in New York City and did the third and fourth copy in the United States. Okay. So I think he may have had some different assistants on the third and fourth one. So then with are those copies, uh, are there any differences? Because, you know, like, I mean, even though it's paint by numbers, essentially, or, or coloring book type of a thing, it, it it's still other people doing it so yes. everybody is unique in their own way even when they're all like you know filling in the blanks right they're they're all very similar yeah but if you put the same section of each painting side by side you can find minor differences okay. between the two yeah the different assistants had slightly different techniques and stuff he did make some ongoing changes too that he was slightly modifying it from one version to another okay um we talked about general armistead in the first two copies he's on a horse People told him that was wrong. In the third and fourth one, he puts him on foot. So he, he knew, he found out that was a mistake. He fixes it. Okay. Uh, he added General Meade in the um, New York copy, and then he adds him to the Boston copy when they spruce up the Boston copy. Uh, he adds more flags. You know, in his initial thing, everybody just had a U.S. flag. Uh -huh. But then he started adding the state flag next to the U.S. Okay. flag. Okay. So he was, you know, I think that's pretty cool that an artist is willing to change his art for realism. Sure. Accuracy. You know, it's like a like a documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, now, he asked about how many are still around. Mm -hmm. um, all four of Philip Bateau's Gettysburgs, besides those pieces, are accounted for. The, uh, the Philadelphia and Chicago one were destroyed. But other artists ripped him off. And there could have been as many as 10 imitation Gettysburg cycle. No way. That were done by other artists that circulated around the country for a while. And one of those has survived and is in storage. It used to be at Wake Forest University. Yeah. Uh, some guys bought it, and they thought they were going to sell it, but they, they couldn't. So they gave it to a, a North Carolina. Um, it's the Museum of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Uh -huh. I think it's in Raleigh, North Carolina. So they have this, this imitation Battle of Gettysburg cyclorama that looks pretty good in storage. The problem is you would need millions and millions of dollars to restore it, yeah. and you need a huge building to hold it. Sure. So they, I don't think they know what they're going to do with it. There's some talk about maybe just putting up a piece of it so people can see it. I would love to see it. Which that. would be really cool. I, and that's one of the knockoffs. Yes. So how would they have done that back then? Well, you'd go to see it, and they sold souvenir photographs of it. Oh. Uh, slides. So. so you could buy the slides. Um, oh, God. Some of the, the rip-off ones look pretty bad. <laughs> I bet. This particular one looks really good. Huh. And uh, we think that one of Philip Toe's assistants might have left, gone to another studio, wow. and did it. He may have even taken some of the sketches and grids with him because the sketches and grids haven't survived. So maybe one of the assistants took it with him, and that's why his copy is so good. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Uh, Kevin Widener says, was it common for 19th century artists to paint historical figures themselves or other non-combatants into their work? Or was this a marketing ploy used by Philip Pateau? That's a good question. Well, we talked about it before that it was. They would do this. Yeah. They would try to sneak themselves in there. Yeah. So not a marketing ploy. No, no. It was, it who was wants a to go see tactic. Philip Pateau, right? Right, right. It's like, oh, let's go see the Gettysburg Cyclorama. Philip Pateau was in it. And I mean, I think there's even examples of guys doing this back in Greek and Roman times sure. where they snuck themselves in there. Well, yeah, because did, 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 he didn't sign the cyclorama, did he? No, because that did would have been Greeks like taking Romans, credit for the whole thing. Right. No, did they, no exactly. So you got to put your mark on it somehow. Right. So there you go. Well, you know, the other interesting thing that artists have told me, I'm, I'm not an artist myself, but they said it's really hard to make up an imaginary face. It is. It's much easier to just copy somebody else's face yeah. and put it in there. So that's probably what they did. They used the assistants. They used the models that they had posing in, in uniform and stuff. Because when you make up a fake face, it's easy to – it doesn't look that's right. That's why I, AI isn't really that good yet. Like the, when you do it, it it's like yeah. that, there's something weird about that guy's face. Yeah. Um, and then according to your book – there is one dog depicted in the painting. Did any of the units engaged have a dog as a mascot? And has it ever been proven that the, it was the artist's dog? So we kind of touched on this before. 
Yeah, I, do, I can't prove it was the artist's dog unless we find a diary or something. But I think it's Sally, the dog from the 11th Pennsylvania. Yeah. If he heard that story, it would make sense because it really does. It's the same kind of, you know, color and, and size of dog and everything. Uh, if you've, for those of you that haven't seen the monument, uh, the little dog, curl, it kind of looks like a pit bull. Yeah. And it was supposed to be brown and black in color, just like the one in the painting. Um, I think Sadie is the name I've heard for the dog over on Culp's Hill. Was it? Okay. I think so. I, for, if for some reason, that name has been bouncing around in my empty head. Um, Mike, you're on the air with a question for Chris Brenneman, yep. Licensed Battlefield Guide. Yeah, I think it's Gracie, isn't it? Gracie, Gracie the dog? Gracie. I knew it was an A something. Gracie was the name. Gracie. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> You think, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, thank you, Chris. And I really do appreciate this. And I really do appreciate the book. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. So thank you. Um, also, one comment about the painting itself. I've seen the painting many times. And there are still new details I'm still finding whenever I go visit. Okay. Recently, I saw the, I, I kind of geeked out at the burning remnants of the bliss farm mm -hmm. that you can see. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive considering he's going off of photographs and the bliss farm would not have been there, but yet he includes that in there. Was I with you, Mike? Um, yes. Yeah, someone that, must've told him. Was, story. I, was I with you when, uh, when you were geeking out on that? Yeah, you were there. You were there with me when I was geeking out. About yeah. That. I feel like that. Because, uh, I was witnessing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is really cool that he realistically shows the Bliss Barn as a burning pile of rubble because yeah. it would have been set on fire earlier that day. Uh, so either when he took the tour, uh, local guide William Holdsworth was one of the first battlefield guides, took him on a tour. Maybe he told him that story, and that's how he knew to put that in there. Uh, there are a couple things, though, that they must have forgot to tell him because there's a few buildings that were built after the war that made it into the painting. Because oh. if they're in his picture... They make it into the painting. Sure. Uh, for example, the Sherfy <laughs> right. barn is in the painting intact. It should be on fire because right. it caught fire yeah. during the bombardment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they had rebuilt it by the time Phil Bateau took his picture, so he shows it intact. And the um, uh, the uh, uh, Kodori barn and farmhouse are not what we see today. There's a big butcher shop across the street. It was built after the war, but it's in the painting because it was in his picture. Because oh. it was in the pictures, yeah. <laughs> now, now, did the I know so the I, barn burnt down the Kadori barn at some point? Is did it burn down before or after the photographs were done? I think after. Okay, so the, so that's the that's the Civil War barn that we see depicted. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have the the white steeples. Right. It's not as big as the modern one, right? And then the house too. I don't remember again if it's pre or post this photograph but the house itself isn't as deep off of the street as it is today that the, they built that on it was basically just a square farmhouse during the battle they, they did build an extension onto it that i'm pretty sure is in the painting so that okay so it's a post battle uh edition but pre philip Pateau's painting or photographs Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They're Got in his it. photos. There's the John's farm, which is behind Friendly's, is in the painting, but it wasn't there during the battle. Right. It was like 1872. Uh, the oh. the trees that decorate the Evergreen Cemetery. That was another one. Are in the painting, but they were <laughs> yeah. they would have been planted yeah. after the battle. The, so they the, the, the line of evergreens you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. It lines the cemetery. Yep. Uh, the Soldiers National Cemetery. Uh, yeah. But they were here when he took his pictures, so they make it into the painting. You know, some some um, rebellious artists should uh, do a really nice copy of the um, the part of the painting that shows where like uh, the Colt Park is and you know Pickett's buffet and mm -hmm. all that stuff, but paint them in. So paint like part of the battle scene and in the background see the golden arches and KFC <laughs> and the neighborhoods as, as just a commentary on how shitty we are as, as a people. <laughs> well, my, my favorite is uh, I've been asked, why didn't they do a cyclorama of day one and day two? Or why don't you animate it? 
And oh. my response is, yeah, <laughs> let's awesome. do all those yeah. things. But uh, do you have the money? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's always money. <laughs> if you can finance that stuff, go to town. You know, yeah. that'd be awesome. No, just do it, man. Just why don't you do it? You're the government. Just do I mean, it. <laughs> you know, you could you could put a platform up on Oak Hill and make a day one cyclorama. That would be really cool. And, though. I mean, it's already there. Ooh. You could you got the platform on the, the the tower. Yeah. Right. I know it's more than 15 feet, but so what? Screw with it. You know, and then you can make another. <laughs> Problem is, though, if you could get the money to do it, some eccentric rich person might say, I'll give you the money to do that. But then who's going to pay the money to go see it? Nobody cares. Who's going to paint it, too? How many oh, guys sure are still around that have to scale? paint it? Oh, the skill? No. Well, no, no, no. That's not true. There would be people that would love yeah, to get right. paid to paint that. But the question is... Who is going to then go and, you know, recoup the cost of making it? Right. And, you know, by, by, you know, by I mean, pay to see it to recoup the cost of it. I don't think I don't think the, the public is that curious. I think like a lot of new things, you know, that we see here the first year, it's like, ooh, look at the shiny new thing. But then after a while, it's like, all right, you know, I've been there, seen that. <laughs> what else are we going to do? Um, all right, Mike, thank you very much for the call. Thanks, Mike. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day, Michael. Uh, all right, and looks like we've got Eric on the line, and he's calling from Atlanta. Or he, no, maybe he wants to talk about the Atlanta one. Well, I don't know. Let's let him tell us. Eric, you're on the air. Well, good good afternoon. I guess we are afternoon now. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, we are. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for uh, taking my call. And thank you, Chris, for the... Uh, the, the show today and a talk. I I just bought oddly enough. I just bought the book uh, a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But but it looks great. You and Sue did an excellent job with it. So I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, Thank you. But what I want oh, you're welcome. What I wanted to ask was, uh, you know, certainly, and I I'm not sure what your knowledge is on it. And I just kind of learned about it myself. And I travel to Atlanta a lot. And certainly it's about a different subject matter uh, than the Negeti's Burke cyclorama. But, uh, you know, what are the comparisons between the, the Gettys Burke cyclorama and the Atlanta uh, cyclorama, the, between the histories of them, the, the methods that they were used or shown? Uh, do you have much information on that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, it's the same time period. Gettysburg was the first one to come to the United States. And it was such a big hit that it started a whole cyclorama craze. You know, not only was Philip Bateau doing four Gettysburgs, there could have been as many as 10 rip-off ones. And then some German artists came over and set up a studio in Milwaukee and started painting other battle scenes. Hmm. And they did the Battle of Atlanta. They did um, a Second Manassas, Shiloh, Missionary Ridge. I would love to so see So they those. did a whole bunch of them. I believe it was 1885 and 1886. They did two Atlantas. And one of those eventually made it to Atlanta, found a permanent home, and that's why it survived. And it's the only other cyclorama that is still on display in the United States. Mm. Um, it's almost the same size. I think it's uh, ours is 377 by 42. Theirs is, I think, 359 by 46. Okay. A little so taller. Technically, it's taller, but not quite as long. It might have a couple more square feet than we do, but it has a little more sky. Right, right, right. But they all had to be about the same size because they made pre-made buildings to hold these paintings. And then that way they could move them from city to city. And it would fit in this pre-made building. And they used to say that they were 50 by 400. Okay. But that's just because that's much easier to say than 377 right, by right. 42. <laughs> yeah. Plus, there was probably a little extra canvas that hung over the top and bottom that was nailed onto that to to hold it in place. Well, and most people can't picture 400 feet or 350 feet. So what's the difference? You know, just say 400. Yeah, make you know, it I don't even. know what that looks yeah. like. But it was a team of German artists. The main guy's name was Heine. That Heine. painted that one. And, uh, um, you know, it's very similar in style, in presentation. Um, I think there's a little bit of difference between theirs because the diorama doesn't come up to the platform. There's a bit of a space between the viewing platform and the diorama, but their diorama has people on it, yeah. mannequins and stuff. But the mannequins are only maybe about three feet high. Huh. 
So it makes up for the fact that I think in Atlanta, he had to build a taller observation platform because it's very hilly terrain and he had to be higher up so he could see more of the battlefield. Of course. At Gettysburg, because you're already on a ridge, right? he's going to be 15 feet high because that's the exact same height as the viewing platform. He doesn't have to fudge it. But the guy that did the Atlanta one must have had to figure out the difference. Yeah. And, you know, when you don't talk about complicated, now I'm really lost. Yeah, see, that's the thing. Is I don't equate artists with a keen mathematical mind. Yeah. That's, uh, I, because, I don't know, math, kiss my ass. But Now, I mean. uh, some interesting things. Uh, they had the cast from Gone with the Wind see the cyclorama in Atlanta uh -huh. after they made the movie. And when they asked... Uh, Clark Gable, what he thought about it, he said, the only thing that would make it better is if I was in it. <laughs> so they made one of the mannequins look like Clark Gable now. <laughs> uh, the artist that did its name was Heine, and apparently he did keep a journal, and it's like written really, really tiny in like an old German dialect. Uh. And they have a guy that's going through and translating it. But it's like a really slow, painstaking process. Sure. But I think he's going to be able to find out some of these secrets about their painting that I wish I could find out about our painting. Uh, Heine apparently went to see the Gettysburg Cyclorama, and he said something like, like, it was okay. Uh -huh. And this guy says that means it was pretty good. <laughs> because this guy wouldn't admit <laughs> somebody else right. is better than he sure, is. Sure. You know what I mean? Oh, I know. Yeah. I know but, people uh, like that. He grudgingly says it's okay, and that guy says that means he thought it was pretty good. Yeah. Um, Eric, anything else? Yeah, I do have one other question, and, and it might be a part of it, a part of the the painting, and, and getting back to the Gettysburg uh, cyclorama. Uh, so again, maybe something you've already touched on, but if you had to pick your your most favorite part of the painting, what what would it be? Oh boy, that's tough. My favorite part of the painting. I mean, just in general, I just love the sense of motion. In the painting, all the people look like they're moving. The horses look like they're moving. Uh, there's a a horse running to the rear, like near the exploding limber chest in the in the middle of the high water mark, yeah. and you can almost see the fear in the horse's <laughs> eyes. Like yes. it really looks realistic. And uh, yeah, I mean, just in general, the motion of the painting is maybe my favorite part. Um, there's so many cool little scenes. I mean, General Hancock looks great. Yep. Alonzo, the death of Alonzo Cushing is a, is a well done scene. Oh boy. There's a lot of good Those stuff. Those might be there. my two favorites. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much in that. To, it's hard to, uh, I love the, uh, you know what I love is uh, just the mountains. Yes. Right? Yes. Like, it looks exactly... I mean, they, they didn't go, well, nobody's going to notice. Like, they did it almost exact. I mean, I can almost imagine the radio towers on the mountain near Camp David. <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? You, you could and paint in Ski Liberty. Ski slopes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, exactly. And it really matches up. And yeah, it does. You know why? It's because we live around here. Yeah. And we look at those mountains every day. Yep. And you look at the painting, you're like, yeah, they're, they're spot on. That's it. Yeah. You know? Well, and the whole view, really. I mean, all the way down a little round top. Uh, the Tawny Town Road and the farms along. The, like, they, they didn't just get the immediate details right. They got... All the detail, well, all the details correct to what he was seeing. I know there's like a farm lane that he has in there that wasn't actually there. You, you mentioned the trees. You know, how about yeah. haystacks? That's a good one because they used to tell people that the haystacks were wrong. Right. When I was a little kid, they said those are French style haystacks, and he only painted them because he's French and he doesn't know any better. Uh, and that's something that I, I found out as I was doing research for this was there was all kinds of haystacks like that around here. And even in the pictures he took while he was preparing the painting, <laughs> you can see a haystack see like right that. by General Meade's headquarters. Yeah. And the answer is, it's not the French way of stacking hay. It's the European way of stacking hay. Which are and, the people who settled here. Yeah, they're, they're Scotch-Irish right. and uh, German immigrants. And really, unless you have a bailing machine or you have a big enough barn to hold all the hay... What else are you going to do with it? Right. You know, and by stacking it up in those haystacks, the, the top would get kind of matted down and then the water would just sort of run off of it once the top got kind of uh, okay. water Okay, that's off. why they did it that way, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the, because uh, it looks, they look like giant mushrooms. So, yeah. and, and is that because people would 
cut or pull pieces of hay off or animals would come and eat the hay? Farmers told me animals would eat the hay or straw, and you know, from head height down. Yeah. You can also see there is an area where they're cutting some of the hay off for bedding. Right. And they're making stacks of hay next to one of the haystacks. Right. Man, could you imagine if you had allergies back then? They didn't have Flonase. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you were sleeping on hay, and you're just like out in these fields all the time. I would have given our position away from the sneezing. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? That must have been tough. Yeah. Miserable. Eric, anything else? Nope, I think that's good. Thank you, guys. Great show. Thank you for the call, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Chris for coming on the show. So I'm going to do that right now. Chris, thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> I really enjoyed this. I love talking about the cyclorama. Well, thank you. I find it so fascinating. We, I could have you. This is our second cyclorama show. We did one with Sue. Now we do one with you. So we got both of the authors of the book and I, I can, I can go on and we'd do it a hundred more times if you want to. I, I love talking about this. It's so fascinating, and I really do recommend, ladies and gentlemen, that next time you come to Gettysburg, if there's an evening with the painting going on, do it. If not, you're not going to be disappointed if you do the regular, um, what is it? It's not hourly. It's, what is it? Uh, every, uh, most of the time, it's every 15, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. <clears throat> if you do the regular every 15 minutes showing, you're still going to be in awe of this thing. It is really fascinating. Um, and with the sound and the music and the lights, it gives me the chills every time I go in there. It's beautiful. So I think you'll like it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you to our patrons for sending in questions and calling in. And thank you all for listening. I think I already said that, but I'll say it again because I really appreciate it. So you have a good night or day or whenever. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, Chris. That awesome. was good. Thank you. That's really neat. Hey everyone, before you go, I would like to highlight a friend and supporter of the show, The Badge Maker, your source for authentic Civil War Corps badges and more. Purchase handcrafted, historically accurate Civil War Corps badges from all Corps. Discover a vast collection of military and civilian insignias of various kinds. Experience the exclusive service of custom hand-stamped reproduction ID discs. At his website, CivilWarCorpsBadges.com, The Badge Maker brings history to life with precision and passion. Thanks for listening. Our hearts so have got a spade for soon to stone. From whence we came, wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down there, and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down there, and pay the reckoning on the nail.